Oh, we're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening. Good evening. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Who wants to lead us in that tonight? Oh, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We ask, dear Father, that you would bless Jeff as he leads us in our study tonight. Please uh, bless each one of us and help us to glorify you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so to kind of ease back into things, and we kind of got caught last week talking about, um, we are talking about the, the impact of materialism. Um, materialism is one of the big isms in fact maybe in some ways the foundational ism of our culture in which so many of the other uh, deformed ideas uh, corrupt world views um, bad philosophies flow from um, and remember last week we talked about it um, materialism when we talk about materialism we're not talking about like being greedy we're not talking about covetousness in this in this class though those can be symptoms of, of a materialist mindset uh, but we're talking about materialism as the idea that all there is to reality is what you see. Um, and that that very much has become part and parcel of our, um, of our culture. And, uh, and we talked a little bit about um, the fact, you know, um, someone rightly raised, well, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, uh, polls and studies will say, you know, 60, 70 percent, I don't know, you know, still believe in God, say they believe in God in polls. But the practical issue is, number one, what do you mean by God when it comes to that kind of a poll in the first place? And number two, saying you believe in God is one thing, but what's the real proof? The real proof is it's not what you say, it's what you do, it's, what you do, it's how you live. And if that is the standard, you know, what percentage of people believe in God? Well, at least the God, well, now it's called the God of the Bible. Well, so that percentage goes way down, and and de facto, you know, really the truth of the matter is where the way a lot of people live, you know, what God are they serving? The God of self and so. So yeah, and so you know, so what does that you know what does that reveal? That reveals that a lot of people really don't believe that there is some, no matter what they say, they don't actually live as though it matters that there is some sort of you know immaterial, unseen realm uh, that there is a God in that realm. Um, that is the master and the maker of all. And one of the things, and this is where we kind of um, we kind of got caught last time. You know, one of the upshots of that then is, especially in our culture, um, I think this has always been true, but especially in our culture. So the truth of the matter is, most people are atheists, no matter what they tell you on the polls. And most, so most people are atheists and don't even know. It. Functionally, they'll say they believe in God, but their lives say they don't. Um, or, or at least not in some sort of transcendent, immaterial God. Um, and so, you know, we, we looked at, and we, we got caught last time, you know, we looked at, you know, in some ways this isn't new. Um, practical atheism, functional atheism, as, you know, is, is as old as man. You know, even back in the ancient world, um, this is where we were looking at some of, some of the prophets and, and, and the psalmist said last week, um, you know, the, the practical atheism that God, would criticize his people for. I really like the way Zephaniah put it in Zephaniah 1.12. At that time, God said, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. I will punish the men who are complacent and who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. And so there, God, you know, God acknowledges the real issue. The real issue in that time and place was not that they did not believe even in an unseen realm or an unseen God. The real issue was, what did they believe about the unseen God? He's not going to do anything about what you do. And so you might as well live practically like he's not going to do anything. Um, and the truth of the matter is, you know, that in that regard, God's people were no different than ancient pagans. Did ancient pagans believe in an unseen realm? Yes. Um, do they believe in gods? Yes. Do they build lots of temples? Yeah. What does Paul say when he goes to Athens in Acts 17? I perceive that you are what? Superstitious. Yeah, very, very superstitious, very religious. But the bottom line is, whichever, whichever way you want to put it, religious or superstitious in that context, what does it show that they are concerned about placating? Something unseen that has power over us and can destroy us. 
whether you want to call his name Zeus, you know, or Poseidon, or the unknown God in the case of Athens, as Paul famously sees that altar and takes off on his sermon, or whether you want to call him Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As Paul, you know, cleverly says, I've actually come to tell you about that guy, that one, that God. Um, so the, the truth of the matter is, while there was always been a practical atheism, the reality is, this is going to take us a little bit deeper to where we, we need to be tonight as we kind of try to peel back layers of the onion a little bit more now um, and, and think about the, 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 the large-scale mindsets that affect our orientation to life and reality. And then last couple weeks we'll talk about some of the isms that affect our lives and our beliefs about how we treat and live with each other. But we're talking about, but those those flow out of these big, you know, what do you think is ultimate reality kind of issues, right? Because, you know, if, um, you know, as Peter Singer at Princeton was at least honest enough to admit, if there is no God, then what does that mean for even a secular version of human rights if there is no God? What are they grounded on? Yeah, you got a problem grounding any notion of rights, human dignity, right? anything. Um, most people don't want to go that far. Most atheists don't want to go that far because that gets pretty scary pretty quick. But at least Singer, you know, is you know, apparently the first honest academic since Nietzsche who similarly admitted, you know, the problem is nobody in Europe, all those European philosophers, nobody wants to admit the implication of God is dead. And if God is dead, what's left as far as finding meaning or deriving rights or any of that? Scary stuff. So anyways, um, we, we need to think a little bit more, though, about how this practical atheism goes on. Because here's the thing. Is the atheism of our time different than any kind of ancient atheism? The correct answer is yes. Yes. Why do you, why do you, why do you think so? I, I agree. Why? Uh, I think in ancient times, atheists do not believe in... They, they did not believe in a particular God. I don't think they believed in no gods at all. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, for instance, you know, one of the criticisms of early Christians is that they were atheists. And you sit there and say, wait a second, but, but to a pagan mindset, why would the Christian confession seem to be atheistic? They didn't believe in any of their gods. Because you're denying, you know, all gods but one, which to the ancient mind, we... You know, so here's the thing that's happened over the past 2,000 years. The triumph of cultural Christianity, and hear me say that very carefully, I'm not talking about true New Testament Christianity, we're talking about cultural Christianity. What do I mean by cultural Christianity? The, the philosophy that the, well, the, they were the, the, I guess they, the, the tenets and the philosophies of the Christian faith led by a church or a, an organization like that yeah. is the right pattern, the right path. To yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and most notably, you know, some, some church or organization <laughs> in, 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 in our history, that would be in particular for, you know, what, about a thousand years, the Catholic Church. And so what happens, so that's what I'm talking about, I'm about cultural Christianity, I'm not talking about New Testament Christianity, I'm not talking about something that Jesus would come and say, yes, this is what I died to establish. I'm talking about something that in some ways is loosely based but there's, a, you know, but there's enough seeds and elements of biblical truth in it so that it can still be in some way, you see what I'm getting at? And so what happens over the past 2,000 years is this adulterated, acculturated Christianity, because I, we just, I don't know whatever word to use to get the, the point across, has so thoroughly transformed European Western culture that, number one, does polytheism make any sense to us now? <clears throat> See how this works? But 2,000 years ago, when Paul and the apostles and the early Christians are going around saying there's only one God, what are the pagans saying? That doesn't make sense. How do I begin to you know, get my mind around that, right? Is that, you with me? We, you know, there is so much that has changed because of the influence of even a hollowed out Christian view of the world that has changed the West. That we now, and, and that's what we, you know, this, you know, I heard someone, I think over here, you know, will, you know, the concept of a Christian nation. I mean, yeah, all of that goes into this, this, this cultural Christianity. Um, and, and so the, the vestiges of, of, of New Testament Christianity are still so powerful the way they have transformed this culture that, number one, polytheism no longer is even an option for virtually anybody. But number two, what it did is it created a new kind of atheism. 
It created a new kind of atheism. Because for the first time in human history, starting about three, four hundred years ago, we can quibble about exactly when you want to date it. The date's not important. But about three or four hundred years ago, as early modern science arose and early modern philosophy developed, for the first time in human history in any culture, the idea that there was an unseen realm that was real began to lose its hold. And in one sense, and again, this is all, you know, now we're moving into a college or grad level class, and we won't go there because that's not what you came here for. But we can talk about how literally the triumph of the Christian vision of reality actually created, and it was almost like God in this promise wanted to sharpen the ultimate alternatives. It's either me, as I am, and as I've revealed myself in Jesus Christ, or it's nothing. And how that actually plays out is another story. But that's the power of even the gospel in its, in its corrupted form spreading through the past 2,000 years. You know, God said his word is powerful. He's not kidding. It completely blew up the way the pagans looked at the world. And it's basically left us with only two possibilities. Either it's all true. And there was no God but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he, we know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Or there is nothing but what you see. But that kind of atheism has darker implications. This kind of atheism, which is not rejecting certain gods or a certain culture's gods or a certain nation's gods, that there is no, truly no God. What are the implications of that? We already talked about some of that just a second. What are the implications of that if there is nothing but what you see? Chaos. Well, how so? I mean, okay, that, that's part of the ultimate no, result, but how does that lead to no, chaos? No standards. No standards. No truth. Okay. And, uh, okay. No standards. No truth. But yet we. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Well, for me, the biggest one is the value of life. There's, there's no, there's no inherent value in life. So, okay. Killing an unborn child. I was about to say. Life. So, do we see some? You know, do we see some examples of, of the beginning of? A society accepting the implications of its unconscious world because we built again 60 70 percent of the nation claim to be but yet what percentage of those people are actually in favor of abortion too at the same time think about it because it's not what they say it's what they do so yes yeah, so that's part of it what else well, well just just for me mm -hmm. if, if you start at that point then it's a downhill slide into total oh, chaos absolutely and there's no way to, there's no real way to stop it logically oh, you know, logically that's the key but are people logical so that's what's going to complicate the claim to be. That's what complicates the ride. People are not consistent. Luke, you had a You said this a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. You said that atheists would see themselves as the greatest creation. They didn't believe in a God. Oh, yeah. That, that at the end of the day. And, and that's the thing is because we ultimately are made in the image of God, and therefore we are made innately, whether we realize this or not, we are made to be worshiping beings. You're going to worship, you're going to orient your life around something. And so there still is a God, it's just us. The most, one of the most profound statements in the Bible after, after you know, God say my name is I am is this, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We could spend a long time unraveling the, the depths of the profundity of what's implied when God says to Moses, okay, so, you know, step number one, no other gods before me. Because that's very much, you know, again, we don't have time to play all this out right now, but that's very much what we're dancing around right now. Yeah, Robin. There's also these brackets when you, when you don't have a God. The worst it can get is whatever a man can do to me. Yeah. You know, might be lose my job. That's the worst it can get because that's all that's that's your window. Right. The best it can get is have this big house and so there's this this bracket of things that are your window of good and bad because you don't there's no better for you. Yeah. There's no hell either. So yeah. There's your. That, that's a great way to put it. And once it's, it it shrinks the horizon. <coughs> of what being alive means, of what's possible. And on the flip side, if I can actually nuance that, because I think that's a great observation. In some ways, not only does it shrink the horizon, but how it shrinks the horizon matters, because to your point, I like the way you put it, the upside comes way down, but there's a sense in which the downside gets a whole lot worse, right? You know, just think World War II and the horrors whether it's, you know, the Nazi death chambers in Auschwitz, or whether it's, you know, at the end of the day, we ended the war and we won, but at what cost? 
you know, as the, I haven't seen the movie. I'm not going to go probably see the movie because I've heard there's, there's elements in it that are not worth seeing. But, but that Oppenheimer movie has reignited the debate about the morality of inventing and using that bomb. Scary powers. And by the way, we take it for granted now. But but those of you who maybe still have parents or grandparents, or maybe you, this might be your childhood in the 50s, anybody remember the, 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 the great fear and, and, and struggle to understand what it meant to live in an atomic age? I think about C.S. Lewis writing a famous essay on living in the atomic age. I mean, people, as they began to sink in, the nightmare of, what, of the power that we had unlocked. Terrifying. Still terrifying, honestly. We just, you know, we kind of made peace with it and put it on the mind. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, Jeff, really when it says, no other God before me, it's really saying, not yourself before me. Oh, absolutely. Because everything comes from us, man, mm -hmm. and it's God in a, in a real smooth way saying, don't put yourself before me. Yeah. And oh, that's, a, that's a great way. There's and everything else falls under that. Yep. So let's do this because because events onto something it's important as well. And let's let, keep on thinking about again what's driving the crazy train. And yeah, okay, Earl. The other part too is not only they don't believe in God, but they have become defiant, like you say, you know, with the ch changing genders and things like that. They're yeah. going again the opposite way as they would, you know. Right. You know, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. In a negative direction instead of even partially positive like most people are. Absolutely. So going back a second to what the vet was getting, and again, think about you know, the implications here, because you know, we, we've already said, you know, in a sense, you know, we're worshiping creatures, there's going to be a God, we're just going to put ourselves on the throat or try to. But the reality is, this is again coming back to the, the, the implications of atheism here, for, and, and the different quality of atheism in our time, in the past three or four hundred years, this is unique in human history, um, is this. So, you know, you have God on the throne. But you don't want God on the throne, so the throne is open. You know, we are atheists. But again, we're going to worship. There's going to be something. We're going to, we have to have something to organize our lives around. It's just, just the nature of things. Um, going back to even Sunday sermon, there's going to be a pattern. There's got to be a pattern for order or else you have chaos. So the problem is, though, in the sense, even though we try to be the God, are we actually capable of filling that role? The what? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so, so de facto, what do you still have... If you if you if you ignore God or deny God, what 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 are you left with? You're actually left with, because our, our feeble efforts don't actually rise up to the level. So if we're you know so so that goes back to again, this is a different kind of atheism. That's not you know we take it for granted now because we live in this. Going back to you know, remember our opening exercise last week. You know trying to understand how much we absorb this unthinkingly in our culture. You know I asked how many of you in in a, in a, in a workplace meeting or a, you know an HR meeting or some training or something. Um, you know how many of you be comfortable admitting that you believe that God parted the sea and Israel passed on dry ground. Honestly, not, 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 not with that you would be personally, you know, you, you, you're, you're waving in your own faith, but how many of you would feel intimidated to say that? And some of you may not, you know, God bless you for that, but all the other raised eyebrows, we all, and, and, and even if, why is it, why is it even an issue? Why is it even an issue? Because in our culture, what? No matter what people say, 60, 70%. If I try to, if I say that in a public forum in my workplace, I might as well say that I, have, I believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy while I'm at it, right? Because that's the power of this, and so we ourselves begin to get a little, you know, even though the truth of the matter is we're the ones who actually understand ultimate reality correctly, and it's everyone else who's living in the delusion, right? So the problem is our atheism is actually a nihilism; it's a nothingness. And so someone mentioned, or a couple of you mentioned, you know, so what happens with this is chaos. Well, yeah, in one sense, that, that's what it leads to. But we don't really want chaos. So what are we doing more and more to avoid chaos? <coughs> Say again? Well, yeah, okay, yeah, that's part of the growth of more law, more, you know. Uh, on the one level, we are, you know, some of the implications, like Steve mentioned, abortion. And on the other side, what's becoming more common already in, in Europe and Canada? It's not just abortion, it's euthanasia. euthanasia. You guys realize our neighbors to the north now have a fairly aggressive euthanasia program? Fairly? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be gentle, but but yeah, Canada has jumped in with two feet on this. Jumped in with two feet on this. Why not? Why not if there is no God? And so you see all of a sudden. And, and by the way, is it is it whitewashed in in all sorts of humanitarian language? Well, sure, we call it death with dignity, or you know, or we just want to ease somebody's pain and suffering. Though the problem is more and more, we're not just euthanizing. You know, they're not just euthanizing people who are suffering horribly with some terminal cancer. What kinds of euthanasias are being performed now in Europe, especially like in in the Low Countries, Belgium and uh, um, yeah, uh, the Netherlands? Thank you. You know, there's some of the more progressive countries, and, and, and even Canada. Now, you know, middle-aged people who simply, you know, they have mental health struggles, you know, like, you know, crippling depression, or at least they think it is, and so they don't want to go out living anymore. You know, this is a long way from stage four pancreatic cancer now. We're talking, we, even young people, 20-somethings, who simply have given up on life. And by the way, and let me tread very, very, very carefully here, very carefully, um, because mental health issues are a sensitive subject for all of us. But it is statistically undeniable in our culture that mental health issues are going which direction? Up. Up. Because of that. And, and that's, that's where we're going. That's exactly right. And if we were to start breaking out rates of mental illness, however you want to define it, because even that could be tricky to define, but rates of it by age group, which age group do you think is going up the fastest? Yeah, everybody already picked up on that. The youngest. Why? I don't see a purpose. Because the Hopeless. youngest among us Hopelessness. cannot remember even the fumes of a Judeo-Christian cultural Christianity anymore. What have kids, say, 20 and under? You know, 20 and under right now means 2003 now. They were born even since 9-11. That is literally a history book exercise to them. So that means they can never remember going to the airport without taking their shoes off, you know, or walking to the gate to meet a loved one. Remember we used to do that? You know, somebody's either going or coming. We go, we walk them to the gate, man. Hugs all around. Now they should get arrested for that. That's like a federal crime. Kids from that era don't even remember without smartphones and the internet and the, the, the absolute fire hose of nihilism that's coming through virtually all their stories, all their culture, everything they've had. It's no wonder. Now again, I, you know, I want to be clear, mental health is a complicated thing. There are people who have mental health issues and it's not you know, spiritual or things, but some of it is. And especially what we're seeing at the macro level in our culture, it's not a mental health crisis in the young men that you're hearing more and more people talk about. It's a spiritual crisis. Because the bill of being fundamentally materialist atheist is being come doing it. Who's going to pay it? The kids are. That's what's going on. You want to know why you have kids in high schools in this very area? I've talked to parents of some of our high school kids. You have kids in high schools in this area. You say, oh, we live in the suburbs. It's, you know, it's sane and safe out here. No, no, no. We have kids in, 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 in suburban high schools out here where we have, our kids go to school with some of these kids. Who literally, you heard of furries? You know, we're, we're, this, is the, you know, this is the next thing beyond transgenderism now, where now kids think they're animals. And they'll wear masks, and you know, could they be dogs or cats? And listen, one mother who volunteers in her kid's high school, high school, told me the administration had to deal with the fact that they've got furries in the school who want litter boxes in the restroom. <laughs> We're, we're, it's not a joke. Now, those of you who have kids in school know it's not a joke. Well, you, you, yours are maybe a little bit enough yet. And, uh, and you're picking their friends well. <laughs> but that's, that's happening in a high school, not far from here, where some of our kids go to school with that. And, you know, I, I make no warrant for what you'll find if you'll Google it because, you know, but, but it is a known phenomenon. Timothy knows he's of that generation. Luke knows he's of that generation. Not that you're participating, but <laughs> well, I mean, no. thanks for being here tonight, by the way. Yeah, in college that was a thing. I mean, yeah. we had students that would be, yeah, what we call furries. I don't know where the, where that term came from, but as we call them. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, but but what's happening? Because there's literally nothing. And the truth of the matter is, we don't make very good gods. We can't sit on the throne. We try. 
But as the bill comes due more and more and kids in a generation arises that has never known any amount of a God who integrates all reality. Think about Colossians 1. What is, what is said about Jesus there in particular? That in Jesus what? All things cohere. You ultimately cannot make sense of creation, of reality, of your life, of your existence without Jesus. And the ancients were at least, and again, this is part of why, you know, again, the, the thing has changed. The ancients, at least, when you walked in and Paul, in Acts chapter 17, sees, you know, you're very religious or superstitious, all these temples are done. The point is, well, why does Paul see that actually as an opportunity? Because they're still asking the right questions and looking for the right thing. See the difference between the ancient common, pagan and today? Common ground. There was still common ground. Because Paul could sit there and say, your altar to the unknown God says, at least, at least, you are still asking the right question. <laughs> It, do you see that? Does that make sense? But we now say that isn't even a question. And thus here we sit. All right, Jan, yes, ma'am. In my day, you could travel and, and come to a church mm -hmm. and go in and expect to hear true scripture. Yeah. Now, you better know where you're going to be stopping because you may be surprised what even in the Church of Christ. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am deeply troubled. I, a preacher friend of mine, um, sent me um, yesterday a note saying, you, you're, you know, somebody that we have both been concerned about, a number of us have been concerned about his preaching and teaching for a while, and sent me a, a note saying, you, you know, you need to listen to what he preached to where he's at earlier this month. And I listened to it last night, and it was deeply troubling. It was deeply troubling. Uh, and that's happening more and more and more and more places, absolutely. Um, deeply troubling. Um, and, and so we really live in a time when people need to be more discerning about what they're accepting and what they're tolerating and what's being preached and taught, what they're subjecting their kids to. Um, all right, um, for sake of time, because again, the quarter's starting to wind down. So part of what happens here, and again, other things that, again, maybe we sometimes have to be careful about getting caught up into, materialism... You know, comes down to this thing called science, or, or, or leads to this thing called scientism. You, know, you recognize the word science in there. And how many of you have heard the word scientism before? It's a real word. Banning always uh, Googles because he's like, that's not a real word, it is. Um, <laughs> some of you, yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, we have a good time. We, yeah. uh, I imagine if we played Scrabble, that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> that's not a real word. Yes, it is. No, it's not. <laughs> Do what? Y'all should start a mission. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah. Poor Hunter, yeah, the Hunter's like, let me out. Um, <laughs> Anyways, um, it is a real word. It's a real thing. It's a real concept. Um, what's the difference between science and scientism, for those of you who have heard the word or the, or the concept before? What's the difference? The philosophical yeah. foundation <clears throat> between the two, I guess. Okay. Okay. And I heard, was that your voice? That yeah. So just breaking the word down, I mean, it's just a belief in mm. science. Not yeah. in what is necessarily true. Okay. But it's believe in the science. Right. You know, in our culture, you know, are, are, is it fair to say that one of the common ideas out there is that, you know, science has disproven God or science makes belief in God impossible or, you know, some notion like that, somewhere along that line. That sound familiar? Somewhat familiar? Um, the problem is that's a statement not of science, that's a statement of scientism. Because can science prove or disprove God ultimately? No. That's not a scientific question. Um, that, that's a whole different issue. Um, and so part of what's happened in our time is we have confused science with scientism. Um, and, and so you see, that, you see that all the time. I mean, here's the thing. Technically, is the origin of life ultimately a scientific question? Can it be ultimately? And the key word is ultimately there, a scientific question. Why not? Yeah. What are some of the foundational issues of the scientific method? Something must be observable, it must be repeatable, it must be falsifiable, right? Is any of that going, coming in, you know, regardless of whatever origin theory or story you want to buy into, is any of that possible? How many origins can we have? One. One. And so everything else is whatever evidence you want to look at, call it fossils, call it, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, um, 
electromagnetic residue of the Big Bang, you know, whatever, you know, whether you're talking to an astronomer, astronomer, a biologist, a paleontologist, whatever. At the end of the day, whatever facts they are mustering, they must interpret those facts according to a pre-existing framework. Where did they get that framework from? You can't get that from science. You can only get that from either philosophy or theology, as we call them. That's where that framework, that interpretive framework has to come from. You're not doing science. And by the way, that's why back before the word science became common for you, what we now refer to as science, you know what the actual two-word phrase was that was used in the early modern era for what we now call science? It was called natural philosophy because they understood that there were assumptions involved that were not science, but were the basis on which they were doing their investigations. Does that make sense? Yeah, laws of nature. Say again? Uh, laws of nature. Law, related to the law of nature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th and, and think about this way, and, and by the way, this is again a larger concept, but part of how Christianity paved the way for the rise of modern science is Christianity says that there's a creator that there are patterns and order and reason of things. And so the whole idea originally of early modern science was um, a shift in the mental model of the universe to more of the idea of the universe as a machine. It has an order, as a pattern, you can investigate it. But what's the deep assumption if you're gonna do any kind of scientific investigation? That what happens once will happen again. Hence the repeatable part. But that's an assumption. Where do you get it from? Well, observation, okay, well now we're in the scientific method. You know, observation's part of it, but just because something happens three or four or five times, does that prove that it must by necessity continue on forever? Or even to the 10,000th time? No, so what were the early natural philosophers, the proto-scientists of our day, what, on what basis did they care of their investigations? They believed the universe had an order and a pattern to it. Where did they get that idea? The, the, the cultural Christianity coming out of the Middle Ages, you know, the vestiges of Catholicism in Europe and so forth. Why did they think the world was an orderly place that you could investigate and make sense of? Because it is. Because, well, because it is, but, but I mean, even more so. Yeah. So, so you begin to see, so there's assumptions that go in. But eventually what begins to happen? What begins to happen is, I think this is where we have to be careful, we don't get caught up in it and our kids get caught up in it, because you know, we talk about science these days, and if you're not talking about scientism the other way, sometimes it's spelled as with the capital S. There's science and then there's science. And, 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 you know, and the problem is not with little less science, the problem is with capitalist science being to make philosophical and theological claims. How did it come to be this way? Well, really pretty simple. As you go through early modern science, it's very successful. You know, knowledge begins to explode. We begin to understand the world. All sorts of crazy things begin to happen in terms of what we're able to do. You know, and, and so whether it's whether it's medicine, whether it's physics, you know, Newton's experiments, you know, and all the the all or Da Vinci. I mean, just all the we begin to leap. We begin to leap way, way, way ahead. And so the apparent success of science. And the fact that we begin to sit there and discern things and understand how the world works a little bit better, what's the temptation as you begin to understand the world, how the world works a little bit better? What's the, what's the implicit temptation? Control. Religion. Control. That's fascinating. That's exactly right. But, even, but before control comes, what did you say, Steve? Religion. Well, religion. <laughs> but, but beyond that, we don't, you know, there's not a God because all of a sudden God doesn't cause you. You know, lightning is not fire from heaven. What is lightning now that we, we really know? Well, it's ionized particles and negative and positive charges between the earth and, the, you know, and, and so forth, right? And so all of a sudden, that's not fire. You know, that was the, no wonder the pagans needed no, you know, gods to explain all this stuff. But with the help of science now, and so science was so successful in explaining things. But here's the question that science forgot to ask to keep itself humble. What can I not yet explain? Creation. Crea yeah, well, yeah, whole, yeah, how we got here. <clears throat> we, now, we, we deluded ourselves with Darwinism. We deluded ourselves. But the truth of the matter is, that's, you know, even, even as much as they hate to admit it, we still called a, starts with a T, ends with a Y. Theory. It's a theory. Oh, as much as they teach it as law. And if you don't think it's a, you know, you know, you know, disagreeing about the law of gravity with a physics professor is like trying to disagree about the theory of evolution. You know, isn't that interesting? The law of gravity in physics, but the theory of evolution in biology. But you think you were disagreeing about gravity to try to challenge them about holes in the theory, things that cannot be explained. 
right? But again, what does science begin to think? Well, okay, fine, we've got questions we haven't answered yet, but give me more time, and just like the past three, four centuries have been miraculous. But then there's this other thing that begins to kick in as well. It's not just what we begin to understand anymore. It begins to give us power. It begins to give us power. I made a comment last week, I saw several eyebrows ruffle, and I said that technology is the modern man's magic, or, or a version of that. Because what was the ancient, what, why did God not want his people, not, not, you know, not saying it was real or anything, but why did God not want his people pursuing magic? Because what's the idea of magic? It's not just as it's not real, but what, what's, what, what, why does somebody want to be, in the, especially in the ancients, as a magician? It's deceitful. It's a deceitful manipulation. Manipulation of what? Nature, event, people. Yeah. yeah, anything. Power over reality. Yeah, Remember the story in the book of Acts, an often forgotten story. Um, uh, Peter meets this guy named Elymas. Uh, sometimes we call him Simon the Sorcerer. Sorcerer. And, the, you know, and, and, he's, and he's doing what he does, but the thing is he meets the apostle Peter who can really do the tricks. At least that's the way he's looking, he's looking at the very pagan mindset. And so he sees Peter doing this stuff, says this guy's got magic. And what does he do? He goes and he offers Peter what? Money, money, money. You know, how, how, what's the right way to get the spirit? Well, repentance, <laughs> baptism, for the forgiveness of your sins, you know, and then God choosing to use you in that way going forward, you know, chiefly through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. But Elamis has the magician's mentality. What is this stuff for? Power and control. And so he finds a guy who can work real magic, as he sees it, and says, you know, teach me your tricks, David Copperfield. <laughs> I like the way C.S. Lewis, but I brought, I brought a quote this week to help underscore this. I like the way C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is in his marvelous little book, The Abolition of Man. There is something which unites magic and applied science. And applied science is his term for technology. There is something which unites magic and technology while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. For magic and technology alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. Make sense? And so we still have magic. We just don't call it that anymore. We have technology. And how do we use it? And again, we keep picking on certain issues, but because certain issues are literally literally, you know, we're getting to some of the end game of some of these ideas, which is why it's really important we understand what's really going on underneath the surface things we're horrified by. What is the relationship between transgenderism and technology? Think about it. I think they can actually make them that. That's the point. Now we call it gender-affirming health care. You know, it's not, you know, it's, you know, we've moved from, you know, the DSM-4, when it was gender identity disorder, to DSM-5, it's, it's gender dysphoria, and the technology is gender-affirming health care to fix it, a euphemism. But do you, re you want to know why third world countries aren't worried about transgenderism? Besides the fact that they're missing a lot, you know, the past three or four hundred years of <clears throat> philosophical baggage, you know, but you know why? They don't have the technology to do it. This is a rich technological man's problem. They're worried about eating tomorrow. That's right. That's right. This is a problem of people who are too rich, with too much technology and too much time on their hand, and have lost the centering principle of life. I think it also, the whole, back to the Bible. If, if, Absolutely. I, if I actually maybe felt that way a little bit, I may just kind of let it go. But when I see that there's so many people that feel this way too, oh, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. I can do it too. And then you have everybody that's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, sociological is called social contagion. Um, you know, it was like I saw a, a, a stat here recently where Brown, you know, uh, Ivy League schools, especially in the humanities departments, a lot of craziness comes out of there because and then because all the other universities want to be like the Ivies, you know, and, and so that, you know the aspirational peers, and so um, but even among the Ivies, there's a hierarchy of crazy town. Um, you know, Yale is not nearly as sane as Harvard. Harvard is not nearly as sane as, and probably the craziest Ivy is Brown. For a variety of reasons, starting with it's in Rhode Island, which should not be a state. No, I'm sorry. Um, but but I, I saw a, a stat here recently. It was like 40% of current Brown students identify as LBGTQ. Now stop and think about that. When the whole push for gay marriage back in the dark ages of 15 years ago now really came to its head with the Ober Obergefell decision in the Supreme Court, what were we told was the actual percentage of the population 
that is legitimately, scientifically, because back then we were still looking for the gay gene or whatever. Though we know better than that now. But but you know, one percent of the population was actually, you know, was actually gay, was actually, you know, needing needing relief in this. Less than one percent. Yeah, it, you know, depending on who you read, but let's use four percent as our benchmark. Four percent. So we've gone from four percent to forty percent in fifteen years. That's not natural, that's not a gene, that's not anything. You know what that is? That's what Robin just described. And and a bunch of kids who are now coming of age to whom we have given nothing. The other part is dependence. They're losing their dependence on God, just like oh, yeah. the science. Absolutely. They're right. losing our dependence on God to answer the question. But to Jeff, our science your, answer. your point of would be giving kids nothing is the whole crux. Oh, absolutely. Because little kids are raised and nurtured in the abolition of the war of God. They would have the right ideals of life, of what life means is still. And a lot of these issues would just go away. Oh, absolutely. Don't you think also we have not been grateful to God Absolutely. for giving us technology, the part that's good for us, Correct. For, and acknowledging that yeah. we haven't really gotten the power. We just have not acknowledged God's goodness towards us yes. and respected his limitations. And we were talking about work. How many of us will stand up and give a presentation and say, I want to thank God for <laughs> giving this. Right. God is the cause of this company doing whatever. You get stoned. I mean, I'm looking oh, at you like, yeah. you know, your blessing is from God. Yeah. And, and it's that fear yeah. to ascribe all glory, praise, and honor to him. And we have to be careful in our verbiage yes. that we don't take credit for these brains that, that was put in us. That's right. That's right. And to that end, let me let us go on this Romans one because I mean you know and we can you know it's, it's it's tempting not to go there every week because so much of what we're talking about is is, is, is Romans one exploded or expounded, but you know given that the vet took us there, um, <laughs> uh, but but right, so this is a good word to end it because she's right. Part of the antidote to all of this is exactly what Paul said in Romans one. It's the word she just spoke, and it's the word that Paul gave in Romans one when you did when he was describing the pagan insanity. And again, part of what I want you to walk out of here at the end of the court is understanding we are more insane than the Romans one world. I mean that's part of what you gotta understand, especially those of us who are raising kids, trying to shepherd kids through this. We are far more insane than what Paul was talking about in Romans one. Um, and maybe by the end of the quarter is that we talk about more of these isms, you'll understand what I mean by that. But that being said, but with that being said, um, Oh, let's see. Um, you know, Romans 1, where, you know, the, the wrath of God. Um, let's see. 18. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not give honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish heart was darkened. The one thing, and this is where we're going to end at the end of the quarter, but one of the things that Paul has emphasized in Romans 1 that we need to make sure that we still firmly affirm is that this is all intentional. That man, you have to choose not to see God. You have to, it is a learned way of looking at the world. It is a conscious choice. And we don't like to think, we like to think more about, you know, well, people just sucked it, but if they can't help themselves. You know, it, Paul says this is, this is chosen. And we'll, we'll talk about that more, because I was to walk away realizing you know, we, this is the level of rebellion. This is intentional. But that being said, gratitude, why is gratitude, why is thankfulness the antidote to all this? And here's why the